Oh, guys, you know, I'm not sure my voice is going to last until the end of this video. <laughs> this one could be a nightmare to edit. Oh, my. We left off part two having explored some ideas about the rule of law. And I finished by saying that in the light of that dialogue, I think we're ready to explore why it is that the UK can be obeying the rule of law based upon arguments about how we derive law and what law is legitimate. Therefore, let's at last look at how the UK broke international law and obeyed the rule of law at the same time. As I think I alluded to in my video on Anglo-Saxon Renaissance, one of the advantages of the UK's so-called unwritten constitution is that it is relatively easy for it to adapt. But an advantage can be a disadvantage. And the disadvantage of this is that if the process of precedent is no longer followed, or some ideological partisan group takes over politics, or if the ruler's aims are explicitly to be revolutionary, then it is easy for the constitution and country to be gutted from the inside. As you may have noticed from the images, these three things have happened, and look where it's got us. The UK has this very unique so-called unwritten style of constitution because of its genealogical history looked at in part two. It might be good to think of the British constitution as more or less a set of codes that act as a national memory, rather than many constitutions which are simply commands from a particular group of rulers or contemporaneous ideas elevated to immemorial law. Therefore, what it allows a British government to do is to be a government of and for the nation, a transcendent concept, and to act in the best interests of that nation based upon empirically tested and derived wisdom. And when the movements of history, both bygone and living, determine that a change in some part of the nation-state or its constitutional sediment is ripe, the UK is able to do this without much aplomb. But it is meant to do it by a series of constitutional processes and in accordance with certain rules. For example, the change should not be manic or factional or abstract, but considered and bearing in mind that transcendent nation and its interest. The change should not contradict the spirit of the constitution or national wisdom either. And if that's too woo-woo for you, then in black and white it should also pass through all of the proper political institutional processes. So this brings me to my first point. When the UK entered the European communities, precursor of the European Union, it ended its rough 500 year or so period of the post Henry VIII constitutional development and settlement and sovereign supremacy which at least intellectually was based upon ancient concepts of Anglo-Saxon or English rights. This entry to the new Rome, which thus amounted to a belated counter-reformation of the assertion of Anglo-British sovereignty, could have been done entirely constitutionally if the UK had wished, because it has a constitution that is adaptable. Now, I think the constitution, the inherited wisdom, tells us that this is wrong, but putting that aside, we could have technically used our constitution to destroy itself and thus the very concept of the UK and commit national suicide. But this didn't happen. Discussions between succeeding UK governments and the various European bodies that were cropping up had been going on since the end of World War II, but it was the government of Edward Heath that finally took the UK into the European communities. Now its actions should have gone through every single conceivable constitutional loop because, as we just said, it amounted to the destruction of the constitution. However, in contrast to Ireland, Denmark and Norway, who all held referendums on the matter at the same time, the Heath government simply used its prerogative to enact what it pretended was standard foreign policy and just let Parliament push the treaty through. This is a prerogative the government does not have, and there's a little precedent to it because otherwise, you know, the government could just sell the country out like Charles I tried and Heath succeeded in. You can see how this attitude towards governance that treats politics as something for an elite class and parliament as an authoritarian oligarchy is exactly the same attitude of the zombie parliament, the pro-EU, anti-British, anti-democratic parliament that tried to take control of the country and stop Brexit. It is this type of thing that I mean when I talk about how a particular ideology and class that today has crystallised as left liberalism took over all of the institutions of state. These people all think and behave in the same way. Well, Heath signed the treaty in 1972, and it came into effect on the 1st of January 1973. From this point onwards, the British constitution was itself a zombie, something that explains the very obvious decline in the mind and body of politics and society since. As others have done before, 
I'm likewise to contend that the UK's membership of the EU has been unconstitutional, the highest level of illegitimate action. How can the UK be disobeying the rule of law in any meaningful sense when international law is upholding a treaty that is itself a political settlement that is unconstitutional and thus void? This tower of lies and deception is simply one grand demonstration of why it is that I personally advocate for, on this channel, politics that is based upon history and precedent and that always has an eye on the nation, those that came before and after us, and also that aims at stability over idealist promises. Because when we make decisions outside of the established methodology, the forward development of society from that point is unstable, fragile and internally contradictory, and that only benefits those who enjoy chaos and violence and who wish to step into the void. If I were to take this point further, I would argue that Brexit is strong evidence for the idea that politics should be based upon history and empiricism and not abstract reason and idealism. To be clear, I'm not a determinist, I'm not saying Brexit was inevitable, and throughout history, England or Britain have always been pretty split 50-50 over critical issues, because that tends to be what happens with binary questions as each individual person weighs up their own conscience. But what I do think is that Brexit is an expression of history, and not simply an expression of someone's own will, or of a fleeting passion, and that it represents an organic readdressing of this particular problem, and a resolution of the contradictions and errors that joining caused. By joining the EC, in contrast to the Anglo-British history, expressed in explicit form by the Constitution, which is sort of what the British Constitution is, well, the Heath government set the state on a path that was entirely incongruent with the realities and genealogy of the nation. The evident decline of British politics and social cohesion I mentioned are, I think, because of this general imposition of which membership of the EU is a part. It is kind of extraordinary how quickly the House of Cards fell and the historical realities realign themselves. For this reaction to be so vigorous, I think, demonstrates just how revolutionary and shearing joining the EC was to the UK. If we think about it, the EU was only christened in 1993, and for the 20 years prior, the UK was far too concerned with the Cold War, with Thatcherism versus Socialism, and with the post-war Maya, to pay much attention to what was a trading bloc but was steadily growing into the EU blob. Remember, this was a time when Germany as we know it didn't even exist, and yet now German and EU interests are, how shall we put it, well that, where it matters, German policy isn't always EU policy, but EU policy is always German policy. And then, from 1993 to 2016, a mere 23 years passes in which the UK, noticing that this supposed trading bloc has blossomed into something that looks remarkably like a proto-empire, starts to feel queasy, like it has ingested something anathema to its constitution, speaking metaphorically and literally of course, and then we realise that what the political class has been trying to do all of this time is in essence to cram an abstract alien imposition down the throat of the nation's genetics, its history, and the nation like a body has ended up regurgitating it, as if having eaten a bad meal or tried to drink seawater. I'm sure that seeing Brexit as an act of vomiting is something that can appeal to both Brexiteers and Europhiles. But I hear you, but I hear you say, doesn't the first referendum that confirms the UK's membership of the EU not legitimise its joining retroactively on some basis of the people's will? No, and I think that principle would be, as it has been, one of the worst, most corrupting principles in all of politics. It would be tantamount to democratically rubber-stamping a tyranny. And no surprise, it is the principle by which EU Commission law is made, and it is the principle upon which the Europhile People's Vote campaign perched itself on. By the time the UK was in the EC, the first referendum was too late. The Demos don't have the right to retroactively ratify unconstitutional acts. This would be a total perversion of the very idea of a democratic process, and something that would be at home in some Soviet satellite state. The correct solution, which was never ever going to happen of course, would have been for the UK to exit the EC in 1975, repeal all of the unconstitutional acts since joining, and then hold a referendum to join or not the EC, and this should have passed through every other hoop of the constitutional process as well. This brings me to my next point. It is highly ironic that the Europhiles are today using letter of the law type legalese arguments to make their case, because back in 1972 when Heath took the UK into the EC, they were making exactly the opposite type of argument. 
Back then, the Europhiles mocked the Eurosceptics as being pedantic and focused upon sovereignty as a legalistic definition and too concerned with proper process. The difference, of course, is that today the Europhiles think they can use law to get what they want, and of course they've been writing and underwriting those kinds of laws that they like for the past several decades. It's why lawyers were so central, and still are, to the campaign against Brexit. But back in 1972, the legality wasn't on their side, so they ignored it. In fact, worse, they actually derided it. Yes, back then, the Europhiles undermined trust in our legal system, which puts their moaning about it today in context as well. Now, because of this, when we joined, the Heath government had to quietly push aside some of the existing constitutional arraignments. Little things like the supremacy of the Crown in Parliament, because now the EC was in charge. But knowing how this might look, and this being less than 30 years after the UK had barely seen off having that same sovereign supremacy removed by Germany, the Heath government decided to pretend that it wasn't happening at all. There is a document known as FCO 30-1048, produced by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and it should be infamous, but for some reason it isn't because it's not well known. It should be. Produced in 1971, it was kept secret until 2002, when the Official Secrets Act wore off of it. The document is very interesting. If you read it from the context of today, then it reads remarkably like a manual for Europhiles, and one that they have all, either directly or more likely by osmosis, imbibed. Titled The Legal and Constitutional Implications of Entry of UK into EEC, the document makes it clear that the government of Heath should conspire to disguise from the public the fact that joining the EC would destroy the UK as we know it. To quote from the document, it advises that as the EEC develops, the extent of the loss of parliamentary sovereignty will grow and grow, and this should be concealed from the British by misdirection. In the last resort, it recommends falling back on the premise that since the UK can leave the EC, then it means we have lost no sovereignty. But the document only feels able to make this concession because it believes that leaving will only be a theoretical position anyway once we've joined. The document also recommends juxtaposing the actual constitutionality and legality of joining the EC with the rhetoric of real international influence to make the former seem small-minded and silly, and the latter clever and pragmatic. Given that the UK constitution was actually made by history, by precedent, and thus by reality, think about what an Orwellian recommendation this is. At over 200 pages long, I can't go through this document here, so let me end with this quote from it. In general, it should be noted that there are few, if any, areas in which Parliament will be wholly free from restraint. It should also be noted that the boundaries which distinguish these areas are changing all the time as community policy develop. In other words, the author of this document believed that what was going on was at some level unconstitutional and perhaps illegal, and amounted to the destruction of UK sovereignty. Contrast this with what Heath said publicly. There are some in this country who fear that in going into Europe, we shall in some way sacrifice independence and sovereignty. These fears, I need hardly say, are completely unjustified. It's quite chilling, really. It really is a coup at the very top of government. And it is very interesting to me that the content and style and tone of this document is exactly the same as that of the British Europhiles today. The arguments about the need to pool sovereignty, that we can leave so the EU has a delicate touch on the nation state, or about talking up the EU as a trading bloc when in reality it is, an, it is an imperial state. These are all the same, as is the tone that the British people are a bit dim and shouldn't be consulted or presented with the truth. It certainly explains how not long after this document, we ended up with a government like Tony Blair's that made lying its go-to policy. But although the document is itself evidence of an extant conspiracy, I think that more importantly, the identical nature of Europhiles then and now is evidence of this class or ideological mentality that somehow has been passed down and passed around, such that it has become the dominant and default position and way of thinking of politicians or indeed anybody working in the major institutions. There is an ideology, there is a dogma, a set of ideas and ways of thinking that are the default position of anybody who is a member of this class or involved in this kind of work. And the evidence of this today is absolutely conclusive, that pro-Brexit or pro-nation state democracy positions are the minority in all of the important institutions, such as Parliament, the civil service, the universities and the media. 
And of course, Europhilia and the approach to it is just one dogma of a set of dogmas held by that class, which dominates all of these institutions that I call left liberals. As a side note, my favourite bit about this document might be how it advises that by the time the British realise what has happened, it will be too late, hence the use of the Official Secrets Act to bury the document. What I love about this is that it shows that the unwritten genealogical effect of Britishness impacts even upon the people who hate it. If this were Germany or indeed the EU, that document would have been incinerated the moment it was read. The EU certainly makes no pretenses to being an open accountable body. Who can forget Yanis Varoufakis secretly recording his conversations because of this? But when it comes to these British conspirators, for some reason they still felt obliged to do things semi by the book, as if there's a proper way to act. As if in 30 years time it'll all be water under the bridge. It's almost sweet, but seriously, I do think it speaks to some sort of gentleman's agreement and reluctance to do anything a little bit too gung-ho. Well anyway, given how strict the EU and Eurofiles are on doing things by the book themselves, more so they say, I'm surprised that a noble organisation like the EC or EU ever allowed the UK to join under these circumstances. I mean, if the UK can't abide by its own constitution, why would it ever abide by the European one? Of course, this was a gamble by the EU. It was pure opportunism. Uh, they hoped that they could bring into effect a perpetual monopoly on politics. But as we said, historical realities had other ideas. Hopefully then that's given a more historical demonstration of the underlying murkiness of this issue to balance the more philosophical perspective given in part two. I think that I could actually stop here because you can't get much more fundamental than this. And because of that, everything subsequent to it is rather moot. But let's continue heading back up to the surface, to that layer of waffle, and complete our journey through the rule of law. As regards to Boris Johnson's government obeying the rule of law, there is an argument from the Europhile side that could have been raised in part two of this video and that I will now put. And this argument is that despite everything that I have said, even if we all agreed that the EU is totally in the wrong, the fact is that the government of Boris Johnson did sign the withdrawal agreement and thus commit the UK to it. Even Nigel Farage complained that the withdrawal agreement was just a new treaty. Therefore, does this not amount to the domestic law of the UK assenting to the obligations of the agreement that are protected by international law? Personally, I think that this is the most powerful argument from the Eurofile side. And yet despite that, I think it is just the densest of the veneers that this whole three-part video has centred around. I mean, on the face of it, I agree. Boris did sign up to the withdrawal agreement, hence the title, How the UK Broke International Law and Obeyed the Rule of Law. But that's my point. The simplistic view that Boris signed an agreement, and so is bound to it regardless, is an analysis that borders on the comatose. We've already seen, for example, how the EU applies itself arbitrarily. How the EU has seen and used this negotiation as an exercise in sabotage. How precedent and democratic law are on Boris's side. How under Roman law, the withdrawal agreement is just a game of two wills anyway. We've just seen that Boris was only in the position of, of signing the withdrawal agreement because we were taken into the EU un unconstitutionally in the first place. And we've seen how that process was knowingly conspiratorial. In other words, the Eurofile view is a view that accepts commandment, the letter of the law, over the spirit. And it ignores the realities of the situation on the ground. And remember what I said, as a historian, I only care about the spirit of the law and not the letter, because what interests me is what is really going on. And what is really going on is that the withdrawal agreement was the product, in the long term an abuse of power and unconstitutional politics, and in the short term a fake negotiation with an EU that wanted to punish and subjugate the UK, and a political class in the UK that was, at best, unenergetic and aloof, and at worst actively working to undermine the UK and enact a coup. The product of all of this was that at the end of 2019, the Boris government was in a position where it had to simply get itself over the line of the general election, clear out the zombie parliament so that it could start having a real negotiation on its own terms with the EU. The result of this is that the withdrawal agreement might amount to international law, but it doesn't equate to anything that I, as I've proposed throughout this three-part video, would call the rule of law. Actually, it's just the rule of a particular power-hungry class of political actors. But let's look into this and consider the nature of democratic nation-states that engage in international law generally, and the scope of action that the nation-state democratic government of Boris Johnson can legitimately take. What is the withdrawal agreement? 
It is an international agreement that says the UK and EU will seek to establish a formal bilateral agreement for coexistence, and it sets out a number of premises upon which to structure the future lasting agreement. The nature of any international agreement is that they can be effectively vetoed by the signatories if at any moment they believe that the premises of the agreement are not being upheld or upheld in bad faith, which means not following the spirit of the agreement. Otherwise, states would not have sovereignty and no state could ever leave said agreements. Well, since the agreement was signed, the EU has continued to act in bad faith and has continued to make demands unique to the UK. The entire Brexit process is really one long demonstration of bad faith, if not hostile intent. We've seen the Brexiteers in hell comment, or the UK colony comments, and I remember right on the very get-go, back in 2016, the EU was straight on the Irish border question and making veiled threats on behalf of IRA terrorists, and it was obvious that they had been thinking about how to use this point for some time. Unlike the UK establishment, the EU was prepared for this political war. And the EU is doing the same things as regards giving British fishing over to it, to preventing the government from actually intervening in its own economy and country, or indeed forcing UK alignment with the EU. These are all incredibly hostile and yes, very imperialistic acts against a sovereign nation state. To show how hostile they are, imagine if the UK was demanding of the EU that it brings Belgium into its territorial sphere and make the UK's de facto border inland of Europe, demand that Germany's economy be controlled by Westminster, and demand that French farmers give their land over to the UK. In the reverse, you see how imperialistic and unreasonable the EU's position is. If international law sides with the EU in this negotiation, then it sets the precedent that international law can be used by a supranational body to piecemeal annex a nation-state democracy by playing off of internal domestic politics. That might be the letter of the law, but that doesn't seem the spirit of any international law I respect. It makes you wonder, doesn't it, why ever did the Boris government ever feel that because the negotiations this year were not going anywhere and time was running out, that they needed to act and protect the integrity of the UK with, with the internal market bill, with friends like these, eh? Funnily enough, the whole concept of good faith is surely a statement that both sides will work towards the spirit and not the letter. If we just did what the agreement said in black and white, we wouldn't need faith. Well, I've already laid out the EU's position, so what is the UK's? The UK is asking for a free trade agreement on more or less the same terms as the one the EU already has with Canada. That's it. This is a position for which there is already a specific precedent and which the EU is obviously happy with. And yet the EU refuses this. And they refuse it on the explicit basis that they won't give a deal like that to the UK because it will be beneficial to the UK. And they don't want that because the UK is geographically close to the EU. I think that ticks the box for bad faith. Evidently, the EU is not negotiating by good faith or by precedent or by trade, but on a premise of hostility. And that same hostility has been shown in the rigidity of the Irish border question that underlies the lawsuit surrounding the Internal Market Bill. When you step back, it is totally beyond any British government to ultimately accept the withdrawal agreement because of this, at least if they care about Britain. What genuinely British government could accept its own state being piecemeal broken up? But I don't find the EU's actions surprising. The history of the EU, both during and before Brexit, is that it acts for its own personal interests, not those of anybody or anything else. If there is one thing that I really disagreed with from the Brexit campaigners prior to the referendum, it was this idea that the EU would just give us a terrific deal very easily. I thought this was nonsense because I'd already seen that the EU would cut off its own nose to spite its face. But furthermore, if we think back to parts 1 and 2 of this video, we've seen how the matter of the internal market bill revolves around presuppositions. Whether you think Boris is obeying the rule of law or not, depends upon whether you think that law in question is that of the nation-state democracy or the supranational state. Of course Europhiles think that Boris is not obeying the rule of law, because they don't recognise the law of nation-states. The whole point of joining the EU is that you believe in empires and you want the law of the EU to be supreme. This is literally a repeat of Thomas More's famous defence that he did not accept the legitimacy of the English Parliament's supremacy. Whether people know it or not, this choice of supremacy is inherent to remain and leave. It was certainly why I chose leave, and if I remember correctly, the number one reason for voting Brexit was sovereignty, so I guess a lot of other Brexiteers agreed with me, something which also rather suggests that, contrary to Europhile propaganda, 
Brexiteers understood the real issues at stake very well. However, as I move to my final point, whilst we all might get to decide which law we think is supreme and argue for it, I actually don't think that Boris Johnson's government does. Let me explain. We know that one of these systems of law must ultimately be supreme, and we know therefore that the government must ultimately govern via one of them. But Boris Johnson is not a five-year dictator, and Parliament is not an oligarchy. This is what the Europhile left liberal zombie Parliament people want, incidentally. No, on the contrary, the Boris government is a body to implement its manifesto. This is what it becomes with modern mass democracy, and I talk more about this in my video on Parliament here. And the government of the UK can only wield such power as is vested in it by the democratic vote and within the confines of the constitution that empowers it in the first place. Indeed, the government of the UK only exercises legitimate authority because of that constitution. Thus, to break the constitution by obliging to the annexation of the very country the constitution is meant to hold together, or giving control of things that should be sovereign, is also to break the very thing that enables governmental power in the first place. The Boris government can only act to execute its constitutional obligations. As we saw with Heath and the prerogative, the government may act in all sorts of ways not clearly stipulated by or against the constitution, but if a moment comes when some act of government conflicts with the constitution, the government has no choice but to obey the constitution because that is the thing that gives it legitimate power and to which the government is empowered to protect. This means that even if the government does something that immediately becomes very clear is in opposition to the constitution, then no matter how stupid it might look, the government has no choice but to reverse this decision. In this case, Boris is obeying the rule of law because he has no choice to do so. He literally does not have the authority or ability to do what the EU wants, even if he wanted to. His office, ultimately, is only beholden to international or EU law in the context of the national law that makes his office legal and constitutional. And there is a great irony to this situation. It was very stupid for the EU to agree to the withdrawal agreement. They might have thought it was a trap. They were right. It is a trap. But it is a trap for the EU, not the UK. Because in the end, Boris couldn't uphold it if the good faith led to nothing. This may well be one of the masterstrokes of modern politics. Because one of the ironies to this is that at the very moment after the UK and EU signed the withdrawal agreement, the UK became an entirely different type of state from what it was the moment before. It became a sovereign state again, removed from the authority of the EU and domestic obligations towards it. In fact, in a catch-22 type moment, it was kind of only by signing the withdrawal agreement, all political realities considered, that the Boris government could be sure it had the complete legitimate authority to overturn it. It's a bit like how Neo had to let Agent Smith beat him to win. I said in part one that it baffled me why the UK government would have given the keys to its own lawsuit, but in signing the withdrawal agreement, the EU really gave the UK the keys to its own defeat. It let the UK escape, and now there is zero domestic precedent or constitutionality or law that binds Boris to the withdrawal agreement. In fact, the Boris government may be the first government since we joined the EU that is actually truly obeying the rule of law in the UK because he is acting as per the constitution and with full sovereignty. We know that Boris likes the Greeks a lot, so I'm sure he'll like the idea of being compared to Odysseus and having tricked the Cyclops into letting him escape. A Boris in sheep's clothing indeed. Thus, I put it to you that Boris is obeying the rule of law because it is the only law that has final legitimacy as per the UK constitution, the constitution Boris is beholden to. And since Boris passed the internal market bill by the proper process of putting it through parliament, clarifying one piece of legislation with another, then by definition Boris's government has been subject to the law, to the constitution, and has done nothing wrong. In fact, let me quote to you from David Wilson QC. The mere act of laying a bill before parliament, which, if it were passed into statute, would break a treaty obligation is not itself a breach of the treaty or of international law. If the legislature passed such a bill and it became an act of parliament, the rule of law requires the government to proceed in accordance with it. This is what parliamentary sovereignty, or to be more precise the sovereignty of the crown in parliament, means. Whether passing such an act of parliament gives rise to a claim under the treaty is a separate issue. In our constitution, 
ultimate sovereignty lies with the Crown in Parliament. It is that sovereignty to which the government is answerable and which the rule of law upholds. So, I bring this three-part video to an end. I set out to demonstrate that the UK broke international law and obeyed the rule of law at the same time, and to provide an example of how I, or a historian, might interpret news stories. I hope I've been able to do this, to show that what looked like a forlorn endeavour is anything but, and at least to provide a propedeutic upon which to sharpen our wits. As for the Internal Market Bill, I hope you've seen how easy it is for politicians of the media to manipulate things to appear clear-cut when they are anything but, and also to show how such people are constantly trying to cut constitutional corners just to get a leg up. And we shouldn't accept this, because it takes a lot longer to undo a mess than to make one. Europhiles don't have a problem with the UK not following the rule of law. They loved it when the UK did that to join the EU. They love it when the EU does it to increase its power. They just don't like it now that the UK isn't following their law. This is why it is so important to understand historical trends, to understand genealogies, and to know that there are many competing ideas out there, and even if they use the same words, they often mean very different things for us. A choice must be made. On the one hand, if we take the EU side, we are forced to admit that the nation-state democracy can only exist and act insofar as it concurs with supranational bodies or international law. But if we take the nation-state position, we have to accept that some states will break international law because of the nation's own proclivities, which can be as far-ranging as Islam, communism, fascism, heck, left liberalism. And since we all nominally live in nation-states, still, we might want to consider these things. This is not an abstract debate. Indeed, the complicated nature of the world is such that there will always be crossover and blurring, and people are weighing up their own consciences. Some will simply think that since the same Boris Johnson government signed up to an agreement, then they should honour it no matter what. To me, this view is naive and ignorant of precedent, but it has a straightforwardness to it. Sadly, as they have behaved for the past years, the EU has decided to prevent the possibility of a compromise by immediately calling the UK a rogue state, a lawless country and suing. Nonetheless, during 2020, negotiations have been going on much, much more quietly, but also much more successfully for the UK. And even Nigel Farage has praised the UK's new negotiator. And perhaps by showing that it would be willing to break the withdrawal agreement, the UK government has signalled to the EU that it really is serious. Theresa May never did anything to demonstrate that she was serious. And honestly, I think it's because she wasn't. For her, Brexit was just a stormy sea to navigate, and not an actual journey to a particular destination. She would have shipwrecked the UK on a desert island if it meant just going with the flow. In the end, the UK might just have to cut its losses, accept the lawsuit, and take the position that it is going to break a treaty because it needs to protect its integrity, and because said treaty was only ever signed due to the calamity of the past 50 years of left liberal anti-British governance. I certainly look forward to seeing what the European Court of Justice makes of all of this. Let this be a warning, may we say, to future governments and voters about making political decisions that only lead to greater confusion and greater corruption and a tower of lies. If the UK is able to overthrow a revolution that occurred in 1973, to cast off a foreign imperial power and perhaps begin the demise of the left liberal stranglehold, then I consider it the greatest compliment to the British people and their nation that the worst they had to do to do this was breach one segment of one treaty with the EU that was itself extortive. And my final thoughts. Hopefully this case study has helped you to interpret the daily events, the daily op-eds and political spiel that run day and night and threaten to drown all of us. It's important not to oversimplify things when we do this or to settle for a skeleton key that is either incomplete or static and stagnatory. This video in three parts eventually amounted to over 15,000 words, and there's still much more that could be said. But in a society where so much so-called news is now more like reality TV, I found this story to be a great example to use. If it gets you thinking and helps you develop your own way of keeping an eye on the news without being overwhelmed or depressed for that matter, then I'm happy. The world got on just fine before the endless stream of media arose, and it would get on just as well, if not better, without it. Thank you.